you just need to get over it. It's not that big of a deal. You don't really feel that way. You're just making it all up. What? What do you mean you feel sad? You don't feel sad. You know what? If you focus on your feelings, you're just going to feel worse. So just be positive and just move on. Why can't you just get over it? If any of those things have been said to you, and especially if they were said to you in childhood, there's a very good chance that you may have grown up in a highly invalidating environment. Now, these things being said here and there, sometimes we're too emotional, we need help kind of pulling ourselves together, but this video is really about what that looks like in the extreme. I keep making videos on attachment theory and a lot of them on borderline seem to be interesting to you guys and so I thought I would make another video really on describing what a highly invalidating environment looks like and why it's so problematic in the development of self, especially as a child. Many of these types of environments are very common in borderline childhoods, that is in those people who had borderline parents and those who also grow up to be borderlines or have borderline traits themselves. But you can have other disorders or just life challenges, not even you know in that regard, where being invalidated is a problem. And I'd like to say that this skill that I'm gonna talk about today, I truly believe is the most important relationship skill of all of the skills, as a parent, as a partner, in your emotional relationships. It is one that most of us were never taught, and if we did learn this skill, it's because it was modeled by our own parents and caregivers, all right? So the core of what I'm gonna talk about, some of the research comes from Marsha Linehan. She is the founder of DBT, which is Dialectical Behavior Therapy. It really is the, the sort of hallmark, I love this word, the, the founding um, theory and modality to treat BPD. It's a very intense therapy, it's a very encompassing therapy, but this idea of invalidating environments was really explored by Marsha Linehan. So, as usual, I've got my laptop, I'm going to read to you really just a few things I want to make notes of and I want to get it right. It says this, according to Linehan, an invalidating environment is one in which communication of private experiences is met by erratic inappropriate and extreme responses. An environment in which inner experiences are dismissed or punished instead of being validated. So what she's saying is that it's this environment where whenever you express what you feel, who you are, anything around your emotions, it is either punished, it is not focused on, and it is rejected and in a severe way and a consistent way. In these environments, she adds, the experience of painful emotions, as well as the factors that to the emotional person seem causally related to the emotional distress are disregarded. The individual's interpretations of her or his own behavior are dismissed. So painful emotions and things that seem related to events that happen and how I feel, those are dismissed. They're rejected, they are punished, and they are completely disregarded time and time and time again. And that really sets the stage for the development of BPD, which as we go back and remind ourselves really is about, you know, identity disturbance, emotional instability, and relational stability at its core. And that really affects all the emotional regulation capacities with self and others in really every regard. So it really is this kind of thing where it's like, you don't really feel that way, or why are you crying? Get over it, it's not sad. Um, it's this constant invalidation. Now, there are some parenting styles that really do reflect what invalidating environments look like. I'm gonna read those to you too, based on another research article which looked at a whole bunch of parenting studies and really sort of assessed how they're addressed in treatment and research, but I'm not gonna focus on that. I'm gonna give you what it looks like because the truth is, Let's assume you are not a BPD parent. 
but you do struggle with validation and I'm and I'm guessing most of us have someone in our life that has a hard time doing this this is that thing people will say to me well I keep trying to talk to him or her and they keep listening to solve the problem I just want this person to say I get it I get I get what you're saying you know I think Susie's a bitch I agree with you or whatever it's like we just want you to get how we really feel all right so the parenting environments that really really foster this and I think these can apply to all of us so they're good ones to pay attention to are listed in this order. So the first one is the parent misattributes the feelings or behaviors of the child to presumed negative aspects of the child's personality or thinking. So what that looks like is let's say a child is acting out at the parent and the parent is saying you're not you're not really angry you're just faking it to piss me off or you're doing it because you're just trying to control manipulate me you know you have an agenda and people will say this about like five-year-olds it's shocking sometimes for those who get triggered by their children but they almost misperceive this parent as any emotion being a threat to them or any behavior as a full-on attempt to control and yeah kids do manipulate but it's not from the place of like masterminding it's from the place of trying to get their needs met and it's really important that you differentiate those and not personalize them the second one is um, the parent cannot tolerate negative emotions and therefore discourages them in the child. Now this goes back to how I was talking about avoidant attachment, right? A lot of these styles where the parent can't tolerate or hold any negative emotions, especially around crying and irritability and stuff like that. So for instance, a parent might tell their child, well, stop focusing on how you feel. It's just gonna make you feel worse. Why don't you focus on the positive? or it's not that bad and just kind of like completely disregards the emotion but mostly because they can't tolerate or hold the emotion therefore they don't want you to have it the next one is the parent contradicts the child's description and interpretation of his or her own emotions and desires it's like this is the parent that says you're not that great at doing at playing violin like don't you know you need to work harder or um, whatever you do, like don't show off, like don't be seen, no matter how good you are, you're never gonna be that good at it. Or saying things like, yeah, you know, why are you feeling so proud of yourself? You still have a lot more work to do. Keep going. The next one is the parent oversimplifies the process of problem solving and downplays the obstacles. So for example, this is one where it even talks about here where the child is learning to tie their shoes. And the dad's like, you're taking too long, hurry up. You should know this already. Anybody who's like not half stupid would have figured that out by now. So it's this shaming and naming of behavior that really disregards the child's realities, that it's difficult to learn to do these things. And they're a process and they take time. So the reason why this matters so much is because at the core, when we say, again and again and again, your feelings don't matter, your experiences aren't real, we are just minimizing the entire existence and value of the person. And as children who grow up with this, if you're told again and again and again that your feelings don't matter, that they're ridiculous, that you shouldn't have them, that you shouldn't um, care too much for yourself, and you should just, you know, just just move on through life and never express yourself. A, you don't know how to do that when you become an adult. And B, you often feel that you don't matter. Now, it's gonna make it really hard for you as a partner to then be a good validator of your partner if you weren't validated as a child. So the modeling of this is really important. Now, before I go into what this is, let me just say this also. This isn't about like every single moment with your child. You have to validate everything and explain everything. I do believe that we've gone from one dynamic of parenting where we had no voice and no power and no words to like this extreme end. But somewhere between the reality of, you know, where we were and where we are is that we want to teach our kids that their feelings matter. Now, sometimes I think therapists are, we're more guilty of this, is that we're so used to like making it about emotions that we can almost over encourage emotional expression to a degree where we forget to bring in the cognitive part which is, but we need to pull ourselves together sometimes, right? So if you're a person who does, that's all you do, it's important to know that you want to first lean in and validate the emotions. And once a person calms down, or a child, then you can go into the cognitive part. So what does that mean? That means that your child has had a fight, their sibling, and they're really upset, they're freaking out and crying, 
or they're really sad about something and you, you calm and soothe, I'm so sorry that's so hard for you. I can see this is upsetting you. You're, you're validating and giving them the feedback that they have an emotion and their emotion matters and you see it and you understand it. And then once that's calmed down, then you can go into the cognitive part. This is all Dan Siegel, uh, which I'll post down below. Um, the Whole Brain Child, Brainstorm, all those great books. But then you go into the left side of the brain, you know, sort of uh, metaphorically speaking, and you help bring in the cognitive piece, which is, I get why you're upset, but you understand that when you throw a Thomas train at your brother and he throws it back at you, you're opening the door for being physical or for, for conflict, right? So it's about validating first. So what does validating look like? What does it look like with your kids? What does it look like with your partner? So I'm going to give you some examples of what it looks like, but I'm going to start with what is an invalidating response, right? So an invalidating response is often met with good intentions. We're just trying to help you contain yourself or we don't want you to get more upset. But what we're doing is we are minimizing and dismissing your emotional response to something. Now, maybe your emotional response is like not very justified, but that is not the point in this part of the, of the communication. This part is about just saying, I get you, I understand, I see that you're hurting or I see that you're upset. And so things like, oh, you're fine, just get over it. No, it's, it could be worse, like, let's not forget. Um, my daughter keeps joking every time I complain about something and she says, imagine how the health workers feel. And it's become this kind of funny thing, but I, I do think it's important sometimes to check ourselves in regard to what we're expressing. So I'm not saying you can never, you know, be like, look, get over yourself, like it could be worse. Um, we're not going to feed that victim or wound all the time, but I think that's the feeling is you think you're you're encouraging your partner to be a victim. I've heard a lot of people say this. Well, if I validate, then she's going to think it's okay to complain about that, or he is. No, we're just talking about the beginning part, which is it's okay. Like I'm saying, sometimes it's not okay, and you need help getting out of that. But we're not talking about that, right? So it's saying things like it could be worse. Just focus on the positive. Put a smile on your face and just be fine. Um, it's not that big of a deal, like get over it, or don't worry, it'll all work out, you know? And there is a place for that, but these responses are not helpful. Or the other one is just telling a child, you're not sad, you're fine, stop crying, why are you crying? It's not that big of a deal. You're being irrational, and you need to stop being so angry. Why are you angry about that? Stop that, you know, things like that. It can also look like a partner just going straight for the problem solving. And so you're, let's say, you have an issue with someone at work and you come home and you're telling your spouse, oh my God, I can't believe, you know, my boss did this again. And your partner starts going, well, you know, your boss has a lot of responsibilities and blah, blah, blah. And then you keep trying to get them to like, to like align with you and say, yeah, your boss sucks, but they don't do that. They just keep telling you why it's your fault or why you should do something differently about it. And maybe some of these things are, are fair feedback. But if you start with that, what you're saying is like, I don't really care how you feel about it. And also what I hear is, and it's my fault that I feel bad about it, right? And if you had an invalidating childhood, that is going to be a huge trigger for your relationship. So how do you avoid doing that? What I'm saying is when you have a situation where there's an emotional response in your partner or your child, you want to first validate. And validation is really this. What you're really doing with validation is saying, I hear you, I get you, I see you, and what you're going through matters to me, right? And so what it really does is it first offers um, a witnessing, an identification of the emotion being expressed, sort of a reflection, a mirroring, which that goes back to attunement. If you've been watching my videos on attachment, right? We're attuning, we are saying, I see you, your feelings matter, and it offers a justification for what that feels like or what that, or what's happening for you. So. Let's have an example. Let's say it's the same situation with your boss, right? You come in the door and you start saying, God, you know, my boss, once again, I can't stand her. She criticized me in front of everybody and she embarrassed me at the meeting because I didn't have my numbers right, but I, I made this mistake with the numbers. I'm, and, and your partner says, you're telling the whole story, right? Your partner says, oh my God, yeah, that's awful. I'm sure that felt horrible. I'm so sorry that happened. 
right now maybe you're thinking yeah you always are careless you don't really watch the numbers sometimes but that is not what you want to say and that will not be helpful right so you just want to lean in that's that word and validate and be like yeah you kind of like join you align you jump in the bathtub with me and you're like yeah that's not a weird but you, you jump in the water with me and you say yeah I agree with you or I see you or yeah that would suck I'm so sorry now your first inclination might be to to jump in, to defend, to try to explain, to help your partner process it and understand it and put all the pieces together. But in that first initial moment, you are helping them feel that they are being felt by you, that they get you. And so an example with your kids is that, let's say your child comes home from school and they start telling you about how they feel really sad because so-and-so excluded them and they were being nice and Maybe you have a spicier kid and you think, yeah, maybe you did something, but you don't want to say that. What you want to say in this moment is, yeah, I'm really sorry. Oh, I'm sorry that that happened. I can see that that's hard or I understand why it doesn't feel so good to be left out. That, ma that makes me mad too. Yeah, and then you kind of process that with them. And then once that part of them calms down and soothes them, maybe later, not always later, not always later do you have to go back in and give them your two cents and your cognitive peace of mind. But let's say it's with your child, right? So with your child, you can say later, okay, you know how we were talking about how you felt sad because, you know, Cameron excluded you? Yes. Well, I'm wondering, you know, why you think that happened? And then maybe your child says, well, I... I kind of like, I didn't want to share with her, but she's just, she, I don't like it. I don't like her. And so you start to process, okay, but how do you think she felt when you didn't share? Do you think she felt excluded? You know, you help them understand that's the cognitive part, right? So you can later teach those lessons. It's just about leaning in first. Same thing with your boss situation, right? Your spouse, in this situation, I don't know that it's always helpful for you to provide your cognitive peace of mind. Maybe you just need to just listen and validate and let it go. The other place I see this in couples is when a partner will say, you know, I am feeling angry at you because you never do the dishes. And the partner comes back and says, um, well, you know, you don't do the dishes either, or I work a lot, or you, you know, you criticize how I do the dishes. The point is, maybe those things are all true, but you want to start with, okay, what I hear you saying is that you're frustrated that you feel like I don't help, or I don't contribute. What does that feel like? You want to address the emotion because what we're normally doing is we're not listening to hear the person. We're not listening to validate. We are not listening to justify. We are listening to talk next or to um, defend, or to justify, or to minimize, or to explain. It's really hard, it's really hard. I have couples in my office do this, and we can spend a whole session sometimes just like, nope, that's not validating. It's like, you know, this like tendency to come back and defend is really ingrained in us. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a skill that takes a lot of practice, but I would promise you that it will be the most life-changing skill for your relationships is learning how to validate. So some other examples just really quickly would be something like, wow, you know, that sounds really confusing. Oh my gosh, that would be hard. I'm sorry to hear that. You have every right to be super proud of yourself. That was really hard. I'm really proud of you. Yeah, I can see why you feel good about yourself. I can see why you feel amazing right now. You've worked really hard for this opportunity. So what you're really doing is you are referring to a specific emotion and giving a justification for it. Now, you may, you may get the emotion wrong and they may say, no, I don't feel that way, I feel this way. Oh, okay, well that makes sense too. You don't have to just get it perfectly right. But your intention should be to lean in and just let them feel that you are with them in this feeling, that you see how they feel, you understand, right? The reason why this is so important is it goes back to all those videos I made on attachment. When a child feels neglected, rejected, and minimized, and invalidated, and it happens again and again and again, it creates a lot of potential mental illness, mental health issues, wounding, and relationship issues. And most of us don't intentionally want our kids to suffer. We're, none of us are perfect, and we're not going to get it right every time, or even half the time sometimes. But I think it's important to at least try. So I hope you found this video helpful. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell, and that way you will get notified when I post new content. All right, guys, thank you so much, and stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.